Hello and welcome to ETF.com's Inside Commodities Week series of webinars. We'll have five straight days of information and presentations about various pockets of the commodities universe from futures, which we'll do today, to hard assets, to other kinds of commodities indexing ideas to gold, and finally on the last day this Friday, we'll talk about MLPs. Again, as I said a moment ago, uh, today we're going to talk about futures-focused commodities investing, a practical guide to commodity investing, five things every investor needs to know. This is a complimentary series of ETF.com webinars, and today's is courtesy of United States Commodity Funds. I'm Ollie Ludwig, the managing editor of ETF.com. We are the leading authority on news and data about ETFs and the company behind Inside ETFs, the world's biggest ETF conference. Before we get started, I'd like everyone to know that they can ask questions at any time during this webinar in the window at the lower right of your screens. And this presentation will be available to all of you about 24 to 48 hours following today's webinar. I may be jumping in from time to time with my guests, so uh, be prepared for that, but there will be a Q&A at the end. Joining me today is John Hyland, the Chief Investment Officer of Oakland, California-based United States Commodity Funds. John, again, is the CIO of United States Commodity Funds. This is the world's only firm that almost exclusively markets futures-based strategies. It helps that United States Commodity Funds uh, investment operations are headed by John. Uh, John, for my money, is one of the most well-informed and articulate executives in the ETF industry. His career in the investment industry spans more than 20 years uh, it, with expertise in various asset classes, including energy, which will figure highly in today's discussion. Again, John is the perfect guest to, John, to launch into our inaugural Inside Commodities Week series of webinars. After all, the business he heads is in a very basic way linked to the seminal scholarship of two Yale professors, Geert Rauenhorst and Gary Gorton. In 2005, these two academics, Gorton and Rauenhorst, published facts and fantasies about commodity futures. In that study, they created an equal weighted index of commodity futures and studied its performance from 1959 through December of 2004. They found that commodity futures delivered similar returns to equities, but were negatively correlated with both stocks and bond returns. Even though commodities indexes existed at the time that those two published that paper, their findings were extremely important and legitimized futures-based investing. These days, there's probably about $35 billion invested in U.S.-listed exchange-traded uh, commodities-type strategies, and, and there is no doubt that the ETF, as well as the ETN wrappers, have opened this pocket of the investment world in ways that were just about unimaginable 15 years ago. It's important to note that uh, one of the United States Commodity Forum, uh, Fund's most successful ETFs, the United States Commodity Fund, it trades with the ticker USCI, is based on an index created by Summerhaven Investment Management. Summerhaven, for those who don't recognize the name, is the commodity indexing firm where Rauenhorst heads up research. This fund, which is based on perhaps one of the most sophisticated broad commodities index, now has upwards of $850 million in assets. As I said, it trades under the symbol USCI. Now, before we go too deeply into USCI and into the strategic commodities allocation that that fund is designed to serve up, it's really important to remember that John's firm is also behind one of the most popular tactical futures-based ETFs, the United States Commodity, uh, the United States Oil Fund. Excuse me, it trades under the symbol USO. That fund has 981 million in assets under management, and it is for short-term trading. And for those who have a strong opinion about where crude oil prices are heading. Of course, we're talking about futures here, and the devil is definitely in the details, and maintaining exposure to futures-based commodities can be complex as well as costly, whether that issue is controlling or accounting for contango, picking the right commodities, and picking the right contracts to own on a given futures curve. The name of the game in recent years has been to understand futures-based investing and to optimize that experience. Now, John, again, is the perfect educator in this growing realm of the investment universe. And with these introductory thoughts in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Hyland, CIO of United States Commodities Fund. John, I want to start off with one quick question just to kick you right off and let you go. Um, we're looking to hit the big broad brush strokes here that advisors and investors need to know. Now, let's talk about some of the major mistakes people make right off the bat when they start out in this area. 
Thank you, Ollie. Um, okay, Here, we, we're going to make about five or six points over the course of the uh, over the course of the hour. These are the things you really do have to handle uh, or uh, have a handle about or around before you dive into this area. Here's the good news, though. You know, I've been in the investment industry about 28 years. I spent 12 years as a mutual fund equity uh, portfolio manager. Commodities are a lot less complicated and and, and a lot uh, simpler. Uh, than you think, and they're actually, uh, in many respects, a lot simpler uh, than, for example, managing equity money. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's the good news. Um, there's also uh, a second thought before we dive into our points. There is a big difference between how you approach investing in any kind of vehicle, ETF, ETN, mutual fund, separately managed account, what have you, that is focused on <coughs> a single commodity, crude oil, natural gas, copper, gold, what have you, versus going into something that's a diversified basket. Uh, typically, the first case is really a tactical uh, uh, selection, as, as Ollie alluded to. It's, uh, it's information-based in the sense that, you know, oil's at 75 bucks, and you have some reason to believe that oil's going 15 bucks higher or 15 bucks lower. Um, and it's also typically a short-term trade in the sense that your belief is going to drive you to a tactical decision that will come to fruition, positively or negatively, in six days or six weeks or maybe six months. But that's about it. When you're looking at baskets, it's a different analysis process. Uh, it's, a, it's a strategic decision. It's an asset allocation decision. It's usually done with a multiple-year uh, or long-term uh, outlook. So these are very different, and as we go through this, we'll try to highlight uh, which what applies to what so that people don't say, well, you know, investing in USO or, or any single commodity uh, ETF or ETN is just like investing in a basket. Uh, it's, they're, they're, they're very different animals. So with that, let's skip to uh, some slides here, and we'll uh, start <laughs> on our first, our first big point. What's our first big point? Here's probably the leading mistake I think people make when they approach commodity investing is that if I go to a room full of RIAs and I said, hey, you know, you guys looking at commodities, and they say yes, you know, if I could open up their head and look in. Hello, everyone. Looks like we lost John for a moment. Uh, we uh, I, we'll get him back, uh, signed back on. Uh, he was just beginning to talk about the uh, the mistakes that uh, commodity investors make. I think that uh, I'm going to jump right in and and, and sort of uh, touch on some of the things. I think John was just beginning to develop. Um, yeah, in my conversations with John, he certainly talks about people thinking about it a little too one dimensionally. Um, it's commodities. It's all about gold. It's all about crude oil, uh, and 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 little else. Uh, and uh, I think what uh, what he's going to drive at here uh, when he gets back on momentarily is that uh, unless you really are in some kind of a commodities-related business, jewelry store, or or an oil refinery, all advisors really want is is an attractive risk-adjusted return. And uh, it that goes well beyond single commodity uh, concerns. They shouldn't really even care in the broad uh, scheme of things which commodity gives that those risk adjusted attractive risk adjusted returns to them. Uh, and, and and this is uh, where uh, the broad commodity funds uh, that I talked about in the intro, certainly USCI, come into really sharp focus. Um, so let's see if uh, John joins back in here. Uh, Ollie? Charlie. Yeah, John, and you back? I am. I am. I okay. could hear you. I just for some reason I got disconnected for from my side. So uh, I think okay, well, I yeah, about... I, uh, I stole your thunder there, but I was just teeing you up as far as uh, the oversimplistic ways that uh, uh, some investors think about commodities, and that and that really risk-adjusted returns are, are really should be the, the the what's in focus here. And, and, and jump right in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the way I always like to phrase it, and remember, although I don't run a gold-only ETF, I do run the oldest and largest crude oil ETF, so it's not that I have anything against people wanting to dabble in gold or crude oil, but 
unless you own <coughs> unless you own a refinery or a chain of jewelry stores, there's no there's no empirical reason why you should be excessively focused on crude oil or gold to the exclusion of other commodities, right? As Ollie was just alluding to, you're, everything, if you're an advisor, is about risk-adjusted returns. So here's like the broad uh, universe of what you can look at. And lo and behold, if I had everybody in a room, I'd say, what was the best performing commodity over the last 20 years? I think most of you are not going to get the uh, correct answers. You're going to guess gold did much better uh, out of this universe than it really did, and you might even think crude oil did better. Uh, we skip ahead. In reality, gasoline was the best performer for the last, you know, 20 odd years, um, and uh, followed by some some ags, uh, some some other some other uh, some precious metals. But you actually find gold about halfway down the list. Uh, crude oil about a third, of, or West Texas crude oil about a third of the way down the list. So the so the point here simply is don't limit yourself to gold and uh, crude oil when you think commodities. You want a good return. You just go to wherever the return is. So what's our, our net? So that's, you know, that's sort of our starting first big uh, thing that you have to focus on. It's not just about gold and crude oil. All right. uh, John, can, can I, can I jump, jump in really quick here? Um, uh, obviously, the United States Commodity Fund specializes in futures-based strategies, but touch on a little bit the different uh, modes of exposure here. Obviously, futures is a very particular thing, and we'll get into that in greater detail. But, you know, we could uh, I could go out and buy a fund like GLD, which is uh, physical-backed, um, uh, and that's very different than, than futures. T touch on a little bit uh, uh, on those differences and, and, and whether one approach is better than another in a given circumstance before we get too uh, granular about uh, the futures-based world that you uh, travel in. Absolutely. So there's basically two ways you can gain exposure to commodities, right? You can go out and buy and store the physical commodity. Your return is the change in uh, the spot price minus storage costs, or you can buy and uh, hold commodity futures contracts, and as that contract expo uh, um, uh, approaches expiration, you can simply sell it and buy few further out and never take delivery. So the first example seems simple, right? And it is simple. You just go out and buy the commodity and you store it. But here's the problem, and the problem is the, uh, the last part of the equation, which is storage cost. There are only really four commodities that you see in an ETF, ETN, mutual, any kind of format uh, that actually back themselves physically, and it's gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. And the reason is because storage cost is very low. Storage cost for, for say, an ETF holding gold or silver probably is running around 12 to 15 basis points. That's what somebody like a GLD pays a bank to sit on all that gold for them. So the return is pretty easy. If gold goes up 10%, you get 10% minus, you know, whatever the ETF or ETN might charge. But of that, a very small amount, 12 to 15 basis points, would be uh, storage. Or if gold goes down 10, you know, same, same thing. Um, the problem is when you move to other commodities, uh, agricultural commodities, industrial metals, energy, what have you, storage costs rise rapidly. Even in industrial metals, which physically are you know, somewhat similar to precious metals in terms of how you store them, uh, it will cost you at the low end 300, 350 basis points to store copper. It might cost you six or 700 basis points a year to store aluminum. And then when you move to agricultural commodities, um, and energy commodities, the, core, the, the storage cost very rapidly becomes double digits. And I don't even know how you calculate you know, storage costs when you're talking about live cattle or, or pigs. So clearly that's not going to work for investors. So instead you use the commodity futures uh, world where your return is still the change in the spot price uh, plus whatever you're going to earn on the 90-day T-bills. Because remember, you don't pay for the futures contract when you buy that contract, unless you take delivery, so you're still sitting on all your cash, and presumably you're earning, earning the 90-day T-bill. And then you have this plus or minus the roll yield, which is backwardation and contango. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So here's two important points, two sub-points of this big point about you know why is some stuff uh, physically based and why is it futures-based. Um, 
the, the, the first is it doesn't matter what you want. Unless you're looking at the four precious metals, it's not going to be physically backed flat out. That's just the way it works um, because of storage costs. The second is which is actually better? Um, everybody sort of gravitates thinking, wouldn't it be great if I could have the spot return you know, of all these other commodities? And then, of course, they cheerfully ignore storage costs. But even if storage cost was lower, uh, is it still automatically better to get the spot price or the futures price? And the answer is, and we'll use copper as an example, it's very commodity uh, dependent and it's very time dependent. This is a chart uh, covering about 10 plus years of copper. Uh, the line uh, uh, second from the bottom, so it's kind of a uh, dark mustard color, is actually the spot price of copper. Uh, as we already just discussed, you can't get the spot price. It's spot price minus storage cost. So the, the, the kind of the, the, the very dark line at the very bottom actually is what you would have gotten if you'd bought and stored copper. But in this case, you see <laughs> two lines above the spot price, which is two different futures-based uh, approaches to owning copper. One just buy the front month contract and roll it. One's a little bit more sophisticated, uh, which sort of moves which contract you own. And you see both of them outperformed it. So actually, if I showed you all, you know, 25 commodities that we looked at two pages ago over the last 10 years, you would see that a number of those commodities, maybe about a third, you actually did better owning the futures than you did owning then there's spot return, even if you ignored storage costs on spot. And then there's about a third where it's kind of a push, and then there's about a third where clearly you did much better with the spot price if you ignored storage. However, once you throw storage back in, you know, well, as I said, you, you can't really get wheat without paying storage. So it's just not practical. But even if you did, it's not automatically a given. So what's the big point here? The big takeaway here is, number one, stop worrying about whether you could get spot for any of the other commodities but precious metals. You can't. And number two, it's not a given that you want to. There are times when the spot <coughs> looks better than the uh, then the futures return. There are times when the future return looks better than the spot. Um, that really just is the way this goes. I suppose you never want to take accidental delivery of a futures contract either, though, right? That's, that's, that's a, that, that, that is a given, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, you know, most of the uh, most of the, uh, the the amount of that's being delivered to you tends to be a fairly uh, large amount. I mean, the oil contract is a thousand barrels. Um, some of these other things are, you know, five tons of this or whatever. So, yeah, generally you don't. Uh, as a practical matter, ETFs, ETNs, mutual funds that invest in these uh, just have strict policies. They roll, uh, they sell out of the contract if they own the front month contract. They'll be out of it typically two weeks before uh, you approach expiration and, and being on the hook for delivery because nobody actually wants all those live hogs delivered to their office. Right, yeah, make your neighbors very angry. But you actually uh, kind of uh, uh, stumbled, in, if you will, into something really important, that, that that is an impossibility in the ETF or ETN wrapper, that there, there is no such thing as taking delivery, right? That's essentially what you just Correct. said, right? No, yeah, which, nobody, which is important. Nobody takes delivery, and, and I don't think any of them are allowed to take delivery. Right. So we've alluded to this roll yield idea. And it's, it's this concept of backwardation and contango. And here, you know, so firstly, we want to touch on that. I think most people, most of the audience has a little better idea of how this works than, say, nine years ago when we launched USO. But also, I know that if you're an RIA, it's a difficult concept to explain to your investors. And to be honest, some of the blame for that lies with the commodity futures world historically. Historically, it's a market dominated by um, physical traders, you know, people at oil companies or Nabisco or, you know, whoever else buying and selling this. And they tend to think of everything what, what economists would refer to as volumetrically, which is I have a 1,000 barrels of oil or I've got 10 tons of this or whatever. And they think in those terms. So when you read, you know, classically when you read explanations of backwardation in Contango, they always kind of talked about how much of the stuff you had. Well, as investors and as RIAs, none of us actually care really about how much stuff. We think about everything in terms of, 
of dollars. So, you know, it's not that you have a thousand barrels, it's that you got a million dollars. So I have spent more time than probably any other human on the planet explaining backwardation in contango. So let me ex show everybody how I now explain it, and it's in a form that's much more intuitive for financial investors. Um, backwardation, of course, is when the futures price curve, the, the price today of every contract, the, 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 you know, the December contract, if that's the next contract, all the way out. If the price of the, the December contract is higher than prices further out, we describe that market as being in backwardation. If the price of the contract further out is higher, we describe that as contango. These are both 17th century British or English phrases from trading days in London. Nobody knows actually how they came up with them. But it doesn't matter. Backwardation, the price is lower in, the, in future contract months. Contango, it's higher. So, how do you explain it, and what does it mean? Well, yeah, let's I can talk. I can say from a journalistic perspective, it's it's a big challenge. So if you've got some secrets, you know, uh, uh, share them with all of us, please. <laughs> well, the key is simply to turn it into an explanation that's similar to what RIAs and, and investors think about, and uh, right. So let's start with with backwardation, and let's assume you have a commodity where the spot price of that commodity is a hundred dollars. You know, the December contract is a hundred dollars. Uh, but the contract prices going forward right now are lower. So January is, you know, 99 and February is 98 and, and all that. By the way, in this example, I assume nice, smooth curves. In reality, curves can be a little messier than that. But for the explanation, we don't really need to worry about that. So think about buying today. You know, if I have to sell the December contract because I don't want to take delivery and I'm buying the February contract and I'm running a, an ETF for example, single commodity ETF. What am I really doing, and, and what is it very similar to? What I'm doing is I'm buying February, which I said was $99 when the spot price was 100 and the, and the December contract is 100 I'm buying February, I mean, sorry, January. I'm buying January at a $1 discount to spot price. Now, if this was a bond, and I bought a bond at 99 that has a par of 100, and it has a month to go or a year to go, what happens to that discount over the course of that remaining month or that remaining year? And the answer, obviously, is it accrues to my benefit. I bought it at 99. We know it's going to be 100 uh, in the future. I earn rateably that discount over time. Well, basically the same thing is going on here. I bought... Uh, an oil futures contract at 99 when the spot is 100, I have a $1 discount to spot. The, the one difference is a month from now, uh, spot may be 110, spot, spot may be 90, right? So it's a little bit different than the bonds in that you don't have a fixed par value. But what I do know is I've, I paid 99 when spot was 100 and spot goes to 110, I made up $11, right? I made the $10 increase in spot, plus I, I accreted the value of the, of, the, of the discount. If spot goes from 100 to 90, I don't lose 10, I only lose 9 because I only paid 99. Fairly similar <coughs> to buying bonds at discounts. Well, what if you're in contango? Well, it's just the opposite. If, uh, if, the, if the contract and the spot price for December is 100, and I have to pay 101 for the January contract. I just paid a dollar premium. And what happens to the premium on a bond if you hold the bond all the way in? Well, you write it off. Same thing happens here. I paid 101, spot's 100. Now, a month from now, when January is approaching expiration and it's the spot price and I get ready to sell it, if spot has gone to 110, I only make 9 bucks because I had to write off my dollar premium. If spot goes from 100 to 90, I lose 11 bucks because I got to write off my dollar premium. Same, it's very similar to buying a bond. In fact, if you look at the yield curve and turn it into a price curve, you will see that bonds trade in backwardation and contango as well. We just never call it that. Um, so that's your explanation. When a commodity, I, I can is hear uh, uh, ba uh, Matt Hogan, the president of ETF.com, when he talks about contango. He's, he's turned some fun phrases in the past. He calls it the voracious gods of contango, <laughs> which which is about how it's eating returns relative to what some idealized spot-related benchmark, right? 
Well, part of it's the idealized. You can't get the spot return. We've already talked about that. But um, most commodities will, you know, tick back and forth between backwardation and contango. Sometimes if it's a seasonally produced commodity like eggs or like natural gas, it's a seasonally consumed commodity. It's a very regular back, in, you know, into backwardation and then six months later into contango and then six months later into backwardation again. Uh, other commodities, industrial metals, uh, crude oil itself, uh, typically don't display the seasonal pattern. So what really drives um, the shape of the curve? Why is it sometimes in backwardation and sometimes in contango? In a word, inventory. Physical inventory of that commodity. If you have a lot of soybeans in storage because, hey, we just had this great harvest, we got tons. You know, we got soybeans coming out of our ears. Um, that commodity will, that futures market will trade in contango because we don't know whether we'll have a lot of soybeans in six months or a year, but we know we have a lot now, so the price today is low. But we may not have a lot in six months or a year, so the price in the future is higher. So a lot of inventory pushes the front price down relative to further out. What if we have a lousy uh, a lousy harvest, the exact opposite happens. If uh, there's t wheat coming out of our ears, <coughs> what do you do if you're General Mills or, you know, you make Wheaties? You don't care what the, the front month price, you have to bid it up because otherwise you have to shut down the cereal factory so the, the, the front month price rises up. But that doesn't necessarily drag up the price further out, so now we're in backwardation. At any given time, most commodities usually have reasonable inventory, so most commodities are in mild to steep contango, depending on inventory levels. Um, but at any given John, time, is, there's is, always uh, somebody sorry, in Sorry to jump in there. Uh, there what you just said, uh, there is this term out there, a, a normal curve, and that refers, I presume, to the fact that predominantly contango is the one that is appears more often than backwardation. Is that is that is does that explain the terminology normal curve? Yes. If someone's referring to a normal curve, they're saying it's contango, that we have reasonable amounts of inventory. If we have lots of inventory, it's steep contango. Um, that, you know, it, it moves around. Uh, it's, it's actually an ad, it's a useful tool because if you're looking at commodities and they're heavily in contango, well, the market just told you that there's a lot of inventory. So you really got a question, do you want to own today, do you want to own that commodity? And if it's in backwardation, the market is telling you inventory is low. So you got to ask yourself, do I want to own that commodity? Um, it's one of the price signals that came out of Gorton and Rowan Horse uh, research, not the 2004 Facts and Fantasies about commodity futures, but a paper that came out two years later called The Fundamentals of Commodity Futures Returns that actually showed, demonstrated quite convincingly, that uh, backwardation and contango are direct market echoes of inventory levels. And in fact, if you use those as, as selection tools, it stacks the odds in your favor. Um, you don't make a lot of money owning commodities that have a lot of inventory. Um, there's just not generally a lot of upside to it. Um, but let's now, talk about the, the broad case of why would you want to own. Yeah, I was just going to ask that very question. And this is a, we're, we're, we're at the risk of getting lost in the weeds of backwardation and contango. Let's do the full pullback here. So, and this takes us probably to, to Rowan Horst and Gorton's research. But why? I mean, uh, why? You know, I could say, John, no, I'm going to be difficult. I just want to own like a commodity-related equities, you know, and I'll be done with it. But why? Why do I want to own commodities? And I presume in the futures wrapper because it's the most uh, uh, broad and, and powerful in terms of giving you market access. Why do I want to do that? Okay, so Gordon and Roan Horse, over 45 plus years, showed that a diversified basket of commodity futures, returns and volatility similar to stocks and bonds, uh, low long-term correlation to stocks and bonds, high correlation to inflation under any kind of Markowitzian mean variance optimization modeling, you would want to include an asset class that showed that showed those characteristics. Let's kind of quickly step through that, though, and make sure we actually believe that those things are true, because they're not necessarily 100% true. I mean, you know, just because Gary and Geert said they were true. Um, I took some of their data, reformatted it differently. This is the annual return for a diversified
diversified basket of commodity futures for the last 45, 50 years. Uh, I could have done this as just a single mountain chart or as a single number, but this is, I think, a little bit more intuitive way of looking at it. If you, if you averaged out all those ups and downs, it gives you returns similar, you know, higher than bonds, um, similar to stocks. The volatility, if you average all that out, is uh, higher than bonds, similar to stocks. Um, you see that there are sometimes you get the 70s, you had lots of inflation, returns were really high. The aught aughts, you had a lot of uh, <coughs> emerging demand for commodities out of uh, out of the, uh, the emerging uh, economies. But even in years where you, even in decades where you didn't have a lot of inflation or you didn't have a lot of uh, emerging uh, demand, you still saw um, positive returns. But you, yes, you do. There are years where you lose money. And the last two, three years have been uh, among those. They haven't been really good times. So I think, you know, we'll give, uh, we'll give uh, Gordon and Rowan Horst a, a, a pass on this one. We think they're correct. Um, risk, you know, you could hey, sort of Hey, John, can, can you flip it back to the 10th just for a quick – I just wanted some, a point of reference here to, to talk about – yeah, thank you. Um, the, the really big spike in the 70s, the two big spots, that, that, that's the oil embargo, I presume, in 73, and then the Iranian Revolution in 79. Is that, is that fair, those two big things? No, not at all. No? In fact, uh, oil did not start trading at a com as a commodity future until 1983. Um, this was this those spikes were were being driven by uh, primarily by um, metals and eggs. Um, okay. But you also had strong inflation. Okay. Um, and so, even though until 1978 there wasn't a single energy commodity future out there, the first one, by the way, was not crude oil; it was heating oil. Um, so this is actually being driven by other commodities other than energy. Um, Interesting. But high inflation yeah. absolutely, you know, seems to correlate strongly with strong returns from commodities. Totally important concept, I presume, at the end of the day. Oh, right? well, we'll touch on that <laughs> again in a moment. Um, risk, standard deviation, you know, I find it kind of a, you know, when you're looking at 40 years and you look at the standard deviation, um, for stocks or bonds or, or commodities, it's uh, I kind of prefer the prior chart where I showed you, yeah, up, down, you know, it's kind of, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But if you if you distill it down to a single number, commodities are in line with, with, with stocks and bonds on the risks standpoint. Um, what about correlations? Correlations have gotten a lot of attention. Um, this is also data from, uh, from, from uh, Professor Roanhorse. Uh, what you find is the long-term average correlation of commodities to stocks and bonds is essentially zero, but it's variable. And it tends to be more variable for stocks than it is for bonds. Um, and a lot of people have thought in the last couple of years that the increase in correlation had something to do with investors and the some people have described it as the financialization of commodity investing. That actually doesn't seem to be true. The, the Journal of Indexes, which is a publication of ETF.com, actually ran an article uh, within the last 12 months where some researchers showed that it actually cor correlations tend to go up when you get recessions. Intuitively, that makes sense. Uh, if you get a recession, stocks tend to go down. When you get a recession, commodities go down, not because stocks are going down, but because people are buying less stuff. Um, and what we're seeing is the further we get away from 2009, correlations are reverting back to the long-term mean. Um, the prior spikes in correlations between stocks and commodities all tended to correlate with uh, with uh, recessions. So here we're going to kind of give them, yeah, with, we give Gorton and Roanhorst, you know, maybe a, maybe a C plus. I mean, they're right that the correlations in the long run are, are effectively zero, but there is a fair amount of variability. But as long as you understand that it's typically related to actual real weakness in the, in the global economy as opposed to, hey, the stock market went down yesterday, um, then, you, you know, then you're still prepared to, to move forward on this. Um, and then correlation of, of, of prices. Now, this is spot prices. This is more Gorton and Rowan horse work, or actually Rowan horse work. Um, a diversified basket of commodities has a very high correlation to the returns, uh, or to CPI. Um, and in fact, a basket of commodities has a higher correlation to inflation than any 
single commodity. For example, gold over this same time period, 1914 to 2011, had a correlation of about 0.3, which was about the average correlation of individual commodities. Um, why does the basket have such a stronger correlation than the individual components? And it has to do with idiosyncratic risk. Uh, obviously, in the long run, commodities will drive up the price of you know many or most commodities. They'll just inflation will just drive up the price because it'll make it harder, to, more expensive to produce, etc. But in the short run, like for eggs, between now and next year, weather will be the bigger determinant. But over 10 or 20 years, you know, inflation will become the bigger determinant. So, uh, by the way, why did uh, get Rowan Horse pick 1914? Um, that's the first year first full year of data after the establishment of the Federal Reserve. So this is sort of the modern central banking era. So diversified commodities, I think we have to give Gorton and Rowan Horst an A here. Yes, they got it right. There is a strong correlation. And it also may point out recent weakness in commodity returns over the last two, three years. Well, we just haven't had any inflation. Um, so let's, do you have a, uh, do you want to jump in here? Uh, Ollie, or do we want to? Uh, I think I think I the, log, the logical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you if you, uh, well, I think I think the question, obviously, you know, where the rubber meets the road is, uh, okay, this is all good, especially what you just pointed out, the uh, the correlation with inflation, and your point about the last two or three years is, is an excellent one because that's that's one something I want to get to in the Q and A. People are doubting uh, Geert and uh, Gary at this point because of what commodities are doing, and I, I I I'm guessing you'll say they're mistaken, but you know what what uh, what do investors have? I, I talked about you know the virtues of the ETF and ETN wrappers. Uh, uh, and that's really created a, a real, uh, real uh, strong inflows into into this kind of a, the piece of the investment universe. What you know, help us uh, frame the decision making process to choose the correct ETF or ETN, as it were. Well, so I said at the beginning, you're you're really looking at two separate animals here. You're either looking at doing a tactical trade, single commodity over the next six days, six weeks, six months or you're looking at a diversified basket. Your choices are ETFs, ETNs, if you're looking at single commodities, um, and if you're looking at baskets, it's ETFs, ETNs, open-ended mutual funds, you know, separately managed accounts, what have you. So because they're different, <laughs> we're going to have two different ways I think investment advisors have to look at it. So let's start with it's a single commodity, and for some reason um, you believe that commodity is going to go up or go down, doesn't matter which, because these are ETFs. You can short them. So you think oil is going to go from 75 to 90, or you think it's going to go from 75 to 60, right? And you have some reason, whatever. So how do you play that? Um, well, first, is your view that this is going to happen over the next, you know, few weeks, few months, or is this like, hey, it's going to take two years? And is that commodity, unless it's a precious metal, when you can, in which case you can use physical um, backed products and ignore the backwardation contango issue, is the commodity you're looking at right now in backwardation or contango? And that's easy. Is the front month price higher than the second month price? They both appear in the Wall Street Journal every day. So those are the two questions you ask yourself. So it's like, I think this commodity is going to go up. I think it's going to go up over the next two months, um, and it's in backwardation, or I think it's going to go down. I think it's going to go down over the next two months, and it's in contango, whatever your choice is, right? So if you build a decision box, it looks like this, right? Either you've got a short-term outlook or you've got a long-term outlook, either the commodities in backwardation or the commodities in contango. So if there are ETFs and ETNs out there that the, generally there'll be an ETF or an ETN for that commodity that at a minimum there'll be one that holds the front month and rolls it forward. If you have a commodity ETF or ETN that owns the front month contract and just rolls to the second month just mechanically, it two things are true. It will have uh, it'll probably be the most. It'll be very volatile. It'll be very reactive to the any change in the price of the commodity because the front end of the curve feels it feels price changes much more strongly than further out, and it will capture the maximum backwardation and it will capture the maximum contango. Backwardation is good. You're buying the futures at a discount to spot. Contango is bad. You're buying those uh, futures at a premium to spot. So if you're looking short term and you have a front month and maybe you have a second ETF or ETN that has a different approach, it owns uh, 
equally weighted the next the, all 12 of the next contracts or every third contract for the next year or it has some approach to minimize contango but it will also minimize backwardation so you have say two choices front month only or some alternative weighting scheme to minimize contango and, and minimize backwardation if you're short term you're just buying something for a couple of weeks and the market's in backwardation what do you buy well you buy the front month one right unless it's precious metals in which case you buy a physical backed one um, because backwardation helps you um, if it's a short-term outlook and it's in contango and you're going to be in it for a week or two weeks or whatever which one do you buy generally you still buy the front month version why well because you want the price reactiveness right you don't want to be six months or 12 months out on the curve if you think something's going to happen right away and even though contango will hurt you it takes a while for that steady paying a premium to erode your return. So if you're in and out in two weeks, it doesn't really matter as much. What if you're looking more long term? If, the sing if that particular commodity is in backwardation, you still want to be at the front end of the curve, so you have the benefit of always buying at a discount and gaining the, the, the benefit of backwardation. However, if you're looking at it for six months, a year, something longer, that's probably not the choice you want. If you have another ETF or ETN that gives you exposure away from the front month, that's probably what you want. Now, you'll notice here, I didn't tell you which commodity is going up or down. I just told you that if you believe a commodity is going up or down, and if there are ETFs and ETNs that track it, this is, kind of, this is the decision box of how you figure out what you're going to want to get to. For most RIAs and advisors, they're not really trading their commodity exposure for their clients, or if they are, they're not doing it very much. So they're more interested in what happens, you know, how do I pick a basket? How do I pick a basket of commodities because I'm looking at it as an asset allocation, as it's a one-year, three-year, five-year hold. I want a diversified basket. I'm not betting on that copper is going up or down. I'm just betting on commodities as an asset class. All right. Here's the most important thing here. There are three things as advisors we all use indexes for. We use indexes to decide our weightings in a in a, in a diversified portfolio, right? You, you, when trying to decide how much uh, U.S. large cap uh, equity exposure to have, you, you will look historically, and then also you'll probably try to adjust looking, looking into the future. What has historically been the returns? What have historically been the volatility? What has been the correlation to other asset classes? And for that, you need some sort of benchmark and inevitably you use an index. The second reason you use an index is if you're going to go passive, you're going to buy an ETF or an ETN or an open-ended mutual fund uh, or a separately managed account, but it's just going to be passively run. Um, obviously, you need an index to be the benchmark for that passive vehicle. And then the final thing is if you're going to go active, how do you measure how good a guy is, right? If the guy comes to you and says, I'm a really good U.S. large cap manager, how do you know he's good? Well, you know he's good if he's beaten the S&P 500 by a couple hundred basis points for the last 10 years. Okay. So there's three reasons we need an index. When you look at, when you look at stocks and bonds, one of the things, and I'll probably get hate mail from my friends at S&P and, and uh, MSCI, but the reality is that indexes in the stock and bond area tend to be very similar if they're measuring or they're attempting to measure the same exposure. So this is over 10 years. This is the average annual volatility and the average annual return for three U.S. high-grade bond uh, indexes, um, Barclays, J.P. Morgan, and FTSE, and for three U.S. equity indexes, uh, the S&P 500, the Russell 1000, MSCI large cap. I'll just use as an example here the, the large cap equity. You know, so let's step back to the three reasons why you need an index. If you're putting in some sort of, if you're plugging in numbers into some model to figure out how much uh, U.S. large cap exposure uh, you should hold, it doesn't seem to me that it's going to make much difference which one of those three indexes you used. If you're going passive and you're going to buy an ETF or an open-ended mutual fund that gives you exposure to a U.S. large cap index, it doesn't really seem to make much difference which one you own. And if you're going active and a manager comes to you and says, I've beaten the S&P 500 by 500 basis points a year, you know that he also beat 
you know, the MSCI large cap and uh, Russell 1000 by about the same amount. So what, as investors, you end up doing is you kind of pick, you know, one of the indexes, whatever strikes your fancy, and you spend most of your time working on implementation, whether you're going passive or active. So you look at things like uh, cost, liquidity, transparency, tax impact, reputational risk. Totally makes sense. Now you approach commodities. You're thinking, oh, well, it's probably the same. So I'll just grab whichever commodity index is convenient, or maybe I'll get one of the old war horses like Dow Jones UBS or S&P GSCI. And, you know, what difference does it make? All right, well, how much difference does it make? By the way, this is also from a Journal of Index article that I wrote earlier this year. And the answer is, wow, makes all the difference in the world. If you put your money in the last 10 years into these, are, these six commodity indices are all uh, ostensibly giving you broad-based exposure to, you know, diversified basket of commodity futures, diversified basket of commodities. Um, but the annual volatility difference is noticeably larger than it is with stocks and bonds, and the, and the average return is substantially uh, higher. There's another key thing here, which is with the, with the other stocks and bond indexes, there's, not, uh, there's, there's a lot of reversion to the mean. So if one year the S&P 500 outperformed the other two, it's pretty, uh, pretty reliably you can predict that a year later, you know, FTSE or MSCI or, you know, I mean, sorry, Russell or MSCI would be the better performer. They just spend all their time trading places, a lot of reversion to the mean. In commodities, this doesn't exist. We're, we see this huge difference, the difference over this time period between the best performer and the worst performer in terms of average annual return is um, over 10% a, different, 10 a year difference, and there's not a lot of reversion to the mean. The three commodity indexes that are at the bottom there um, in terms of annual average return uh, accounted for eight of the ten worst annual performances. The three commodity indexes that are much higher up on the, on, on the graph accounted for seven of the ten best performances annually, and none, none of those three were ever the worst performer in any given year. So you don't have a lot of reversion to the mean. You clearly have this huge difference in, in how you do uh, based on your index. So now let's step back and say, well, how how this impacts the three ways you use um, three ways you use indexes. If I go to if I'm trying to decide whether to include five or ten percent of my client's money into commodities, and I look at the last ten years, and I look at the return of the GSCI or the Dow Jones UBS, which are the two at the bottom, I would conclude that there's not enough return to justify the volatility, and I'd end up with a zero weight. If I look at one of the better performing commodity indexes, I might come to the exact opposite conclusion. Um, second use, if I'm going passive, which one would I rather be benchmarked to? Over, these six represent probably 95% of all the products you will ever see are benchmarked to one of those six commodity indexes. Um, it's been a little bit less than five years since all six have live an ETF or ETN attached to them. The difference live, real money, ETFs or ETNs, the difference between the best performing and the worst performing ETF or ETN uh, among those six is a cumulative dif difference in four and a half years of 25%. It absolutely makes a difference which index you use if you're going passive. Finally, if you're going active, if somebody walks up to you and says, hey, I'm an active manager, i got a separately managed account, or I have an active fund of some sort uh, in diversified commodity space, I've beaten my benchmark by 400 basis points a year, your next question is, what's your benchmark? And if your benchmark is one of the you know, ones at the bottom, you may not be that interested in paying for active management. If it's one of the ones at the top, send me the guy's number. I'd like to talk to him. Um, so it makes a huge difference how, which index does what and how you get into it. 
um, as, as to whether you're either, either going to own commodities, if you go passive, whether you're really going to make money, and if you go active, whether you're really getting any value uh, for taking the active decision. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit, and then we're probably going to damn near go to questions now. Um, the difference between the, the broad base, the difference between the, the commodity indexes you're seeing there, the ones at the bottom that have really done poorly over the last 10 years and the ones that have done well, is the ones at the bottom are generally of the old design. They were all created 20 years ago. Um, they weren't created for investment purposes per se. They were created simply to give you a convenient way of knowing whether commodities went up or down today. But they weren't necessarily created to be something that you'd actually want to hold. Um, that has changed. Some of, everybody reads Gorton and Rowan Horse Research. Everybody figures stuff out. Um, the first generation uh, of indexes, things like the Dow Jones UBS and the S&P GSCI, very static in what they do. They don't attempt to sidestep backwardation or contango at all. Um, they have, many of them have odd ways of weighting it where you end up 70% energy. Go back to like my first slide, unless you own a refinery, why would you always want to be 70% energy? Um, over, you know, starting nine, ten years ago, you started to see sort of a second generation where attempts were made to sidestep contango and benefit from backwardation. And then starting five, six years ago, and this was really does come out of the work of Gorton and Rowan Horse, you see indexes that attempt to capitalize on the backwardation and contango present in the market, overweighting commodities that are backwardated, underweighting commodities that are in contango, and then a month later or three months later as things change, reshuffling the deck. So you're always staying with the backwardated commodities. The difference That's USCI, right, John? No, the, third, the, the third generation, it would be USCI that you're talking about, these, these two variables that are well, over I, time, yeah? Did want to be too promotional, but Gorton and Roanhorst were the godfathers of USCI, or actually the Summerhaven Dynamic Commodity Index, SDCI. It was right. the first uh, commodity index of this design. It is n not the only one in existence now. Um, people read everybody's research, so and people read everybody's prospectuses. So, but this is the direction that commodity indexing is going. That they're not going to be static and that they're not going to just sit at the front end of a curve, that they're going to actually try to optimize returns and, uh, as a general theme, stick with overweight commodities with low inventory, uh, underweight commodities with high inventory, and then by necessity have to adjust on a monthly or quarterly basis to kind of to stay on top of that on, on that issue. So that's the final point. If you don't get the index right, in diversified commodity investing, you cannot make up the difference in looking at the other traditional points of expenses, liquidity, transparency, tax impact, reputational risk. It doesn't, you know, there's just, you cannot gain enough in lower expenses to offset 500 or 800 basis points a year of difference between, you know, better index and worse index. Um, so you have to, refocus your time. You have to take to heart that there, these indexes are different. Their construction methodologies are different. These are all well laid out. There's actually an article in the Journal of Indexes from a couple, about two, three years back talking about uh, the history of commodity indexes that sort of teaches a little bit about this. This is what you've got to get your handle around. Otherwise, it's a flip of a coin whether you get a good index or a bad index, and five or ten years later, whether you had a good outcome or a bad outcome. Got um, it. Well, I think we'll uh, are we about ready for questions? Are you uh, you got anything else to say in your in your prepared uh, comments? Because I uh, there are a few questions here that came in from the audience, and certainly uh, uh, a lot of curiosity out there, John. Um, I'll just throw out my parting thoughts for people to look at, and if they want to throw out some questions on that. But if you do have some questions, uh, Ollie, let's go to them. Uh, I, I think maybe uh, slide 10, just to, uh, I, I wanted you to look into your crystal ball for a moment. I think that was the one where you had that bar chart where, where there were all those returns over the years. Uh, and, you know, what do you see going forward? Clearly you talked about it, and there it is. Thank you very much. An environment that is uh, inflation-free or very light on inflation these days, even deflationary fears around the planet and different economies. What do you see going forward uh, as it relates to uh, inflationary pressures and, and the commodities uh, investing universe? 
All right, so I'm no economist, but uh, I'll give you, <laughs> but I'll play one on television. I'll do the on the one hand and on the other hand and on the third hand. Um, if you're looking at what an expectation would be for diversified commodity returns over the next five or ten years, some recent work out of Yale by Gert Rowenhorst um, <clears throat> has, has sort of addressed sort of the, the forecasting issue. Um, and what's going to drive it is a combination of your real global GDP expectation and your inflation expectation. Inflation being a somewhat bigger driver than real GDP. Uh, but those are two macro factors that you could look at trying to determine, you know, if I, if I go into diversified commodity exposure for five or ten years, am I going to make 5 percent, 8 percent, 10 percent, or 15? So if you look at <clears throat> If you look at the history, and if your expectation for the next five to ten years is inflation is going to remain, you know, zero to three, or minus one percent to plus three percent annually, <clears throat> you would expect the returns on a diversified basket of commodities based on your own horse work, what you're seeing here, you're probably looking at single-digit returns in a diversified commodity portfolio. Six, seven, eight percent. You look at the kind of returns you might have seen in the '60s, the '80s, or '90s, right? Those kind of numbers, um, which means over ten years, you know, hundred dollars becomes one hundred and seventy or one hundred and eighty dollars, which is what this chart's showing. You probably not. You shouldn't have an expectation to do a lot better than that. If you get a lot of inflation, or even if you get, you know, three point one percent to five or six percent inflation. This dramatically changes your expect your expectation. Very quickly becomes say low single digit average annual returns. Um, maybe you know so a hundred dollars becomes three hundred dollars. Um, the second leg of that sh uh, second shoe there is uh, to drop is your real global GDP. Um, if inflation remains moderate but global GDP perks up, once again maybe 7 to 9 to 10 percent returns if it, annually over the next 10 years. If it really perks up, 10 to 15. The, 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 the perfect storm, of course, is lots of inflation and lots of real GDP growth. I don't know how many people have that as their base case. Yeah, understood. Well, uh, we have a couple questions here. We're technically coming right up on the end of our hour, but I want I do want to ask this, and, and you know, they're, they're reflective of, of the real curiosity out there. Um, is it useful to think about the, what uh, Summer Haven has worked up, and then and those who have uh, who have sort of uh, copied them? Uh, this third generation indexing methodology you spoke about is that is that what, can we call that smart beta? I mean, it's a very trendy thing, and I, I'm a, I, I, and but I have to ask the question: Can you shed some light? On the the waiting process, you know these two things. You're, you're on different parts of the uh, of the curve. You're you're waiting commodities differently. Can you can you get a little granular there? Sure. Firstly, uh, smart beta. You know, <clears throat> the reason I, I prefer to refer to them as third generation commodity indexes is because I invented that phrase about six years ago. So I have a little pride of authorship there. I did not invent smart beta, so I'm not sure we're going to call them smart beta. However, how does it really work? Um, so you know, if you have a universe of you know, 15, 20, 25 different commodities. Gordon and Roan Horse work suggests that you want to overweight ones that are in uh, low, have low inventory, and the best real-time price signals for that are uh, certain price changes over certain long periods of time, like 52 weeks, but mostly the shape of the curve, backwardation, contango. So the simple first step is just look at your universe of choices and then just sort of overweight those that are in backwardation or very mild contango because there's telling you that there's that inventory is not that heavy and that tilts the deck in your favor. Um, the second thing though is you know regardless of what you're going to own, it, you you look this is the way the second generation and the third generation commodity indexes work is if you're going to be 10 percent into copper, right? Whatever your selection process is. Um, and you're looking at the curve, and the curve is in backwardation, you want to buy the, the, the contract month that's most backwardated, that gives you the most bang for the buck, gives you the best you know, discount to spot. Usually that's the first or second month contract. If it's in contango, you want to minimize contango, so you'll usually end up buying further out on the curve 
where, where, where the steepness of Contango kind of flattens out, and you'll stay away from the first or second month contract, and maybe you buy the six or the nine or the 12 month contract, and minimize your Contango. So there's really two levers you have to move here. How much you weight in a commodity and why? Do you just blindly always buy 70% energy? Good luck. Or do you try to adjust it to reflect um, market conditions? And then once you're going to be in a commodity <clears throat> at a given weight, which month do you buy? Add the two together, and you end up with a pretty powerful tool that looks like smart beta, um, although a lot of people have, accused, or have told me that it also looks suspiciously like uh, active management. But if you can describe it as a formula, which you can, it's not active management. Got it. Uh, we we uh, we are running out of time here. A lot of questions will come in. I would encourage you all to reach out to John at United States Commodity Funds to get your questions answered. I have zero doubt that he will answer them, and with gusto, which is his uh, his characteristic way to approach his work. Uh, I, I would want you, John, one last uh, thought, if you could uh, share with uh, with the attendees. Uh, there's some confusion about just who Gary and Geert are. If you could re uh, contextualize their importance to this space uh, of uh, of the investment. Universe, please. Sure. Uh, Gary Gorton and Geert Roanhorst are two uh, uh, professors at Yale. Uh, one's an economist, one's a finance professor. Uh, they've written on many, many topics, but the paper they did in 2004, Facts and Fantasies About Commodity Futures, uh, is probably the single most cited paper uh, in, in people looking at whether or not uh, diversified commodity exposure should be included in a, you know, traditional asset allocation mix. Um, their paper in 2006, uh, 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 Fundamentals Commodity Futures Returns, which identified the, or not identified, the whole idea that inventory is a powerful and predictable driver of commodity returns actually dates to John Maynard Keynes and uh, Nicholas Caldor, it's known as the theory of storage. Um, but uh, Gary and Geert and another uh, professor from the University of Tokyo, Fumio Hayashi, <coughs> actually demonstrated it was true that not only does um, inventory levels um, seem to persistently identify better returns and worse returns um, in commodity investing, but that the shape of the curve, uh, backwardation and contango, uh, is directly driven by inventory levels. And because it's observable in real time, allows you to decide uh, what you want to buy without having to wait two or three weeks for inventory figures to come out. These are two of you know many things that they've done. Um, so I would I would say that Gary and Geert are probably the two foremost academic practitioners of uh, you know looking into the space of commodity investing. Um, I mean there are others. There's other good work that's been done out there, but these are probably the two heavyweights in this area. Got it. That's, that's perfect, John. Uh, that is all the time we have for today's webinar. As I said to you, go, to you all a moment ago, uh, if you do reach out uh, to have your questions answered, uh, I'm sure you'll get them answered. There were some questions that were left on the table that were quite good. Uh, so that's all the time we have for a practical guide to commodity investing, five things every investor needs to know. Again, I want to remind you this is Inside Commodities Week, a series of five webinars that will be happening this week, including the one today with John Hyland of United States Commodity Funds. To review, we'll be talking about hydraulic fracturing tomorrow with Van Eck. Uh, we'll be talking about commodities indexing, further ideas with Bloomberg indexes on Wednesday, gold on Thursday, and we'll round it up on Friday with a discussion of MLPs. John, uh, thanks very much for being here, and thank, uh, thank you, the audience, for attending. Uh, on that note, on behalf of all my colleagues at ETF.com, I'm Ollie Ludwig, wishing you all a pleasant afternoon.